Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure for me. I'm Amit Bal, consultant oncologist from Bristol, uh, to be chairing this session with three dignitaries here. Uh, and this is from the SEOG meeting session, looking at the management of elderly with prostate cancer. So we've got Professor John Perry Droz, who's the president of the SEOG prostate cancer guidelines. And to complement him, we've got Professor Nicola Mote, who's the president of the EAU prostate cancer guidelines. And I think to bring realism and sense into the whole conversation, uh, we've got Henriette Burns, who's a research coordinator from uh, Princess Margaret Hospital, Toronto. I hope you'll find this discussion very inspiring because the population dynamics are changing. We have to manage elderly patients more and with newer treatment options that are coming, it is incumbent on us to make sure that we are well versed with the tools that are out there, courtesy of all the research that goes on. So Professor Mote, would you be able to sort of give us some idea regarding how the EAU guidelines uh, are coming to terms with the elderly population and the changing face of radical treatment in the elderly? Well, the first point is the EU guidelines are linked to the SIO guidelines because they are both co-endorsed. Uh, probably the first message is age is probably a marginal issue. It's mainly comorbidity. So if you check, for example, early diagnosis and individual early diagnosis, there is no age limit. There is no age limit, but there is a life expectancy limit and it's between 10 and 15 years, that's based on the radical treatment that showed a benefit beyond 10 years and not before. The second message is uh, a low risk disease, low risk prostate cancer disease, standard of care should be active monitoring. Probably active surveillance for these men is probably too aggressive because it's based on repeated biopsy. And we have to remember that the PROTECT trial that were for low risk mainly, but also close to 40% intermediate risk, at 10 years of specific survival was exactly the same in the active monitored patient and the actively treated patients. So it's probably, probably an, an overactive treatment to treat them if they belong to the low risk. For the intermediate risk, and even worse for the high-risk local disease, they must be treated provided they will benefit from the local treatment. Uh, surgery, as a surgeon, surgery is feasible whatever the age, but the patients have to be prepared to more side effects the older they are, and that's directly related to age. The more urinary incontinence they have after surgery, and also the more impotence rate they have after surgery. If the patient is prepared for that, that's fine, but they have to be prepared for that. We strongly believe that the local treatment, either surgery or radiotherapy, are both as effective, so it's a complete nonsense to say one is better than the other. The problem with a high-risk disease is that it's not radiotherapy monotherapy, it's radiotherapy combined with systemic treatment, and especially with long-term systemic treatment. And as we are jumping to the side effects of the long-term treatment, probably Jean-Pierre will discuss that more than I. And clearly we have to balance always for local disease the benefit of the local treatment with the side effects that we induce for the local treatment, and the benefit must really be there. And the real thing is that local aggressive disease are clearly undertreated. The, probably the most important mistake to make is to think, well, is old, the local treatment is too aggressive, I just give ADT. We know that's clearly not the way to go. I think you've made some really very important points because it's like, you know, reducing the over-treatment for the low risk and improving the under-treatment for the high risk. And, and that's where the sort of bulk of our effort should be going into, really. Absolutely agree. John Perry, what would you say about like, uh, you know, assessing these patients regarding their fitness, because 
we know age is a number, but what we want to know is how best can we assess these patients in a more practical way um, rather than a very convoluted manner, which is very difficult in regular clinic practice when people have busy clinics, you see. Um, I think uh, that uh, really it's true that chronolog the chronological age is not a good manner to uh, take in charge of this patient. So comorbidities are well known as pregnancy factors and a major factor of uh, uh, duration of life and of uh, uh, side effect of treatment and particularly of uh, local treatments. But uh, additionally, there are other aspects we must take in, in uh, care. Yes, uh, so comorbidities, but not only the number of comorbidities, but the uh, importance and reversibility of comorbidities. The second is uh, not uh, only the performance status, but also uh, the activity daily living or instrumental activity, activity daily living. And finally, not only, but uh, malnutrition. Uh, there are uh, other points which are important as uh, social and familial aspects and economical aspects because a lot of uh, older pa uh, patients are poor. It's uh, important to consider. So in the SAR guidelines, we uh, <coughs> introduced two, three steps, in fact, a screening uh, with a G8 tool, which is only a tool, and the screening of um, a cognitive impairment with a mini cog. Uh, but it is, you know, it's not a diagnosis, it is uh, only a screening. So we have to go to the diagnosis. And then the second step for health status should be to consider comorbidities, malnutrition, and uh, activity daily living. And in the other side, on the other side, uh, the diagnosis of uh, cognitive impairment if uh, minicog is abnormal. And in the third step, uh, geriatric assessment to propose uh, geriatric interventions. I am not sure that busy uh, clinics and uh, short time to, uh, to evaluate uh, older patient is uh, uh, really a good medicine. So I think if we want to decrease the side effect and increase the benefit, and uh, so to increase the balance between the two parts, we need time. It is very important to consider that, I think. I think that's a very important message uh, also for me personally because we almost always consider the busy clinics as an excuse in a way. Uh, we adopted the G8 tool in our practice and actually when patients come in and register at the reception, they get given that form, you know, and, and by the time you call them into the clinic room, they have filled that form. So it doesn't take much long to assess that. But uh, I found it two points you made which were really very crucial to me and I hope to the audience because one, you talked about comorbidities and making sure to check reversibility of comorbidities, which I think whilst people record comorbidities, they tend not to sort of look at the reversibility or managing the comorbidity because that should not in itself preclude a patient from a life extending or life prolonging treatment, you see. Uh, and, and the second thing that you mentioned is how do we establish that support? Because doing the assessment is fine, but it is then requiring people with expertise who will help us out with managing these patients because, you know, we need the geriatrician support. Maybe geriatric oncologist should be the one looking after these patients at that phase of disease. I'm not yet clear in my mind how well established those rules are in regular practice. I think uh, th this is increasing in uh, activity and uh, also uh, organization. So, 
you are right. Uh, maybe uh, geriatric oncology subspeciality or um, <coughs> work together with a geriatrician and second, the geriatric uh, networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that in our uh, rich countries, there are a lot of uh, initiatives which are taken to organize the uh, uh, management of uh, older patients uh, at their home and not only at the hospital but with Good. a network. Good. Henriette, you know, when we talk about research and even though in majority of the research trials, age is not a criteria itself. But <coughs> what I'm fascinated with is that we then have subset analysis showing men above the age of 70, men below the age of 70. And in your role as a research coordinator, because not every man above the age of 70 is frail or vulnerable. You know, there are, there are many men who are fit. Do you feel that you know, adopting the subclassification in the elderly and then showing the benefit of those agents would be a better way of doing things. Well, that's interesting. It's mm. an interesting mm. approach. Um, usually men with metastatic gastric disease and prostate cancer are older. Um, so we have older patients in study. Uh, and even if they are not frail at the beginning of a treatment, they can become frail very mm. fast. So I think um, designing studies with, with a geriatric assessment as, as a tool is important. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, the general perception, and this might be my inherent bias, and I admit that, but you know when you have trials in your center which are open, you have a younger patient with metastatic gastric resistant prostate cancer, you are very keen to offer the trial. But you have an elderly patient walking into the clinic and like Nicola said, you know, there is that nihilism about do I really need to treat him because, you know, how do you approach that? I mean, what do you feel patients, the elderly patient population wants as support or their understanding of research and how much open can we be with them? We should be fully open, but how do we do that? We, we do need to be open, otherwise we'll never have um, uh, evidence of efficacy in the older population if you exclude them. Hmm. Uh, so we need to exclude the, the patients in that, but we have to do that in a way so that it, they are, it, it's for patient safety that they are well monitored and uh, that comorbidities that, that can be um, reversed are reversed. Mm -hmm. So if you were designing trials for metastatic CRPC, apart from putting the tools in there for cognitive function and for <coughs> health evaluation, like the G8 tool, uh, you know, given your vast experience, having talked to these patients on a daily and regular basis, do you feel that sometimes the patient information leaflets can become too daunting for some of them. They are they are often very daunting <laughs> for patients, and uh, also um, the the patient's family will read the the mm -hmm. leaflets, but not necessarily the patient. And there comes a point where the patient has doesn't have all the information, and um, and doesn't fully understand what his treatment uh, entails, mm -hmm. and that can lead to uh, other um, like safety issues for patients. It's very challenging jobs and I think that's why the research faculty or the research fraternity are to be complemented on en enabling these patients to take part in trials, thereby giving us the evidence to improve their outcomes. Yeah. Right? yeah. So w what we will do now is, John Pierre, if you can give me your top two messages from the session today, which you would want people to look at, follow, or imbibe in their practice? I think that apart as the need to evaluate uh, health status, uh, the first is to consider that uh, treatment, either uh, local treatment or uh, medical treatment for advanced disease is as active in uh, older patients and in younger. This is one message. 
But the second is that maybe side effects are more important. And then there are uh, three uh, different, uh, this is not a balance, this is in fact a, a balance with three parts. The first is what could be the, not the life expectancy, because this is a patient, not a population, mm -hmm. but what is the uh, uh, chance of uh, living of these patients apart prostate cancer? Second, what is the benefit of treatment, uh, expected benefit of treatment? And third, what are uh, the side effects? Uh, Nicolas uh, talked about uh, side effects uh, lo for local treatment. We must be aware of the fact that uh, medical treatments have a lot of side effects. And not only side effects, but also a uh, relationship with health status. That means that older patients, it's, it's generally known, have some uh, risk of uh, uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis, but it is increased by uh, androgen deprivation therapy. But not only that, it increases also <coughs> uh, the uh, cardi cardiovascular uh, disease is in general. It increases uh, risk of diabetes, of hypertension, but it's true also for the new drugs. And depending on the health status and these comorbidities, which may be pre-existent, there are side effects uh, during the initial phase of treatment, but maybe if the patient is living sufficiently, there are long-term side effects. And we must wait this very carefully, and it is there are tools, however, but it is a clinical problem. Good. Thank you very much for that. And I think that message encompasses a lot of knowledge and experience be behind that. And I think this is incumbent on all of us to be looking at these patients and treating them as a complete entity rather than just focusing on their prostate cancer. Uh, Henriet, W what would be your two messages to the audience regarding <coughs> encouraging them from research-based activities? So if, if doctors um, uh, are, are giving systemic therapy or treatment for metastatic prostate cancer, they should uh, think of trials uh, where older people could be involved, but also uh, the importance of including a geriatric assessment for this population. Thank you. Finally, Nicola, always like to give you the final word. <laughs> so two pieces of gems of advice from you. Well, the first one is uh, uh, senior adults or older patients, I don't know how you want mm. me to call them. When we treat them, we have to base our treatment decision on two things. The first one is on very clear and good evidence that is not related to age. Simple example. Newly diagnosed M1 disease with minimal disease, does this patient really need to be treated immediately? This has nothing to do with age. So we clearly need absolute good evidence, independent of age. And second, as Jean-Pierre said, the second message is, it's not because you're old that you will not benefit from an active treatment, even an aggressive active treatment, provided you will benefit from it. And the message, at least for surgeon and probably also for radiotherapists, is there must be a balance between the benefit and the side effects, and it has to be individualized. It's easy to, to have a low PSA. It might be completely useless to have a low PSA because you will die far before your disease will kill you. Thank you. So I think we've seen that the messages are simple, but they're very clear that elderly patients deserve the same benefits of treatments as any other patient population, but managing them involves managing their whole general health-related fitness and 
as was pointed out, the metabolic syndrome and the side effects that the ADT therapy can also cause. So I hope you found this discussion lively. I personally did. Thank you very much. Thank <music> you.